Righteousness and of your praise. Thank you. 
Why is love the greatest? Because love is action. Love is resilient. Love is compassionate. Love digs deeper, goes further, reaches higher. Love gives and then gives some more. Love is big and love is small. One great hour of sharing has been putting our love in action all around the world and right here at home for over 70 years by responding to disasters, 
feeding the hungry, digging wells for those who lack water, building for those who need shelter, caring for the sick, empowering the marginalized, and equipping those who are ready to change their world in the name of love, God's love. Because when all is said and done, it's love that remains. Put love into action. Give to one great hour of sharing. Good morning. I'm Yvonne, and I'm here to uh, let you know that our one great hour share sharing campaign after five weeks concludes today. It's our annual campaign. And I just want to let you know that, you know, in the devastation of the um, unprecedented flooding in Kentucky, already one great hour sharing money is there. We couldn't take a collection quick enough. They are there. They are ready. That's what they do. All we need to do is our part to make their job doable. And so our goal is $3,000. And I um, just want to do a little math. Um, if you think of the sea of need, oh my gosh, all over the world, there's refugees, there's hunger, there's floods, there's drought, um, there's, you know, economies that have gone bust all over. Well, um, Doctors Without Borders has made a point about um, one, for every refugee, there's one in a hundred people are refugees. And so in, in the world, one in a hundred. The good news is that leaves 99 of us, which reminds me of the story, the parable of the lost sheep, the one in 99, which reminds me of Roger's message on May 18th um, in the series on mercy, the value of the lost. It's just unbelievable that he would leave the 99. And by the way, we are the 99. We're in the pen, right? We're safe. It's the one out there that, that he leaves everything to go after that one. And what kind of value is that? So um, our goal of $3,000, let's say, okay, uh, there aren't, uh, you know, 99, you're not talking about Christians. If you just talk about a 10 to 1 ratio, maybe there are 10 Christians for every one person hurting uh, what that could do. That would be, uh, for us, it would be $300. And what could that equate? That could equal um, um, a hotel night, a couple of hotels uh, nights. It could, a, a week of groceries, um, a, a goat um, and chickens. It could um, plants. It could provide books, all kinds of things. We have no idea what our offering is going toward. We don't know where it will go. But God does. And we, Jesus goes after the one. And we are his body. We are his hands and his arms. It's us. We, we, we're not waiting for anybody else. It's us. So um, God does his best work in hard times. There are hard times everywhere. And I think God has his eyes on one or two or three or four that he's going after with this kind of crazy love. And he can't reach him without our help. So um, if you would join me in prayer. Dear Lord, I lift up this offering to you to use as you would will. Lord, I know that you already know what lies before us, the things that will happen in the coming years, and we do not know. But we do know that they will happen, Lord, whether it's floods, droughts, um, uh, poverty, war, hardships, underdeveloped communities that are striving to do better all over the world, Lord. You know these things. You hear their prayers and you go after them. Lord, I pray that um, this, with this campaign, love remains. Lord, um, faith, we will need no, need no faith in heaven. We will need no hope in heaven. And I believe that love is a sweet perfume that will be all around the feet of Christ, Lord that he will smell forever and ever. Lord, may we be part of this. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't, um, there are envelopes, just to know, if you haven't given and you'd like to, um, Cynthia does not send the check out until the end of the month. 
you still have one Sunday. Thank you. God bless you. So what do disciples do? We learned last week that disciples pray. Next week, we're going to talk about disciples reach, which you've just heard a great testimony toward. That's what we're about, is touching others for the glory of Christ through our offerings, through our invitations, through our sneaking up next to each other, and, and people who don't have a clue who Jesus is. That's how we reach them. And that is our purpose. That's what we do. And there's a couple ways I want to invite you that, to work that you can do to reach people. Um, and the first is, is we're having our back to church blast next week. We invite you to come right after church. We'll be eating together and fellowshipping. There'll be all sorts of great activities for the kids. Come and join us. Bring your enemies. We'd love to have them here and uh, participate with us. Also went out on email this week. Uh, was an invite to participate in many different small groups and other groups that are going on. You can do that simply by taking your camera and taking a picture of that little, what do they call that, scan, an RQ code or whatever. You can do that, and it'll take you to where you need to go to register for various things. And then also uh, tonight, if you're bored and want something to do, you can go off of Navarre Street, roughly 21, uh, and, and go to the duels. They're opening up for a soft sell. Their timber beans place. They're giving you food and ice cream. Everything you purchase regarding foods going to the church. Isn't that not cool? So eat a hot dog for the church. Uh, and then finally, uh, we're blessed to share that the Reeses are doing really well. Uh, you can pray for especially them and their children. Their children start school this coming week. And that's a big transition. Uh, they're uh, doing well in Mexico. They're learning their lessons in, in Spanish. And uh, they're having lots of fun with uh, mistakes that they're making with people. And um, it's fun. You know, I was trying to speak some Swiss a couple years back to a couple. And uh, I, I thought they were talking about her being the apple of her eye. And I was speaking in Swiss. And I said, oh, she's your dried prune. Language speaking's fun, man. You can have a good time. It's still a joke 15 years later with that family. Did you hear what that guy called us? A dry prune. I think it's Svechka. Anyway, but yes, support these folks in your prayers. What do disciples do? Well, one of the things that we do besides pray and reach is we worship. And today we're going to focus on worship. And we're going to look at the concept of worship and grow through the concept of worship. Now, when the Lord instructed Moses about worship, the first thing he did is he created a place of worship. It was called a tabernacle. And eventually, the tabernacle was a tent that would move wherever Israel would go. And eventually, uh, the tabernacle turned into what was called the Temple of Jerusalem. It was a structure built to let people in. But also, it was a restrictive structure. Only certain people could go into certain places in the temple. And you had to be of the right pedigree to go into certain places in, to the innermost parts of the sanctuary. Now, if we were to illustrate it here in the midst of First Baptist, for example, we would call this area around the communion table the holy place. And only one person should ever be in that holy place, and that is the leader, the pastor, the priest. The high priest would only be allowed into the holy of holy areas. And then there were the areas where the priests would go, such as the chancel area. Those people engaged in worship, leading worship, participating and helping others lead in worship. They would only be allowed on the stage. Then the participants of worship, let's say the main floor, would be for the religious appropriate people. And balcony, tough luck. You would be the outcasts. 
you would, not to be, you would not be allowed to go any farther than what they would call the Gentile court. Now, in ancient Jerusalem, in the ancient temple, you had the Gentile court, which is the outer part of what you're looking at. And honestly, uh, anybody and everybody was allowed to go in there and enjoy it, and it was for the outcasts. Inside of that were women, the women's court. They were allowed in there. And inside of that, though, was the men's court. And it became further restricted the farther you went in. Then you had the priest court. And then inside that, you had what was called the Holy of Holies, which was separated by a huge curtain. And only one priest a year would allow to be go into that area to do what they would call the sacrifice of atonement for the sins of Israel. Now, comes in Jesus. And what we learn is Jesus dies on a cross. God's blood was shed to bring the forgiveness and a new dimension into the access of God regarding worship. When Jesus shouted his last, the scripture tells us, both in Matthew 27, 51, Mark 15, 38, as well as Luke 23, 45, we are told that the curtain literally ripped from top to bottom in the midst of that place that separated the Holy of Holies. It was torn in two, and Jesus, in the breaking of his body unto death, rips that curtain apart to symbolize for us, because of the sacrifice of God for humanity, we now are allowed access to the most intimate place of worship called the Holy of Holies, and it is the place where true worshipers can go. And it's in the midst of that concept and all that stuff I just described to you that brings us to our scripture text today. And hopefully with that little bit of preview, you now can understand it deeper as we read it. I want to invite you to stand as we read God's holy word to show our respect for his word and just let this word fall over you as we encounter God's sweetness and what he's given to us. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, we read these words. Therefore, my friends, since we have a confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through the breaking of his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with true heart and full assurance of faith that our hearts sprinkle clean from the evil conscience and our bodies are washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us now hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and to do good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let's pray together. God, as we take into this word, help us realize the gift you've given us to be able to have you within us, to be living temples for you. Help us, God, uh, walk with a deeper appreciation that how we can, through our worship, increase our encounter with you to grow more in the way that you would have us to go. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we're in this concept of worship, and we're in this thing called doing what disciples do. And as we focus into this worship concept, uh, it's one of the things that we need to understand. The one thing that separates the church from all other organisms or organizations throughout the world is the fact that we worship. We worship. Our focus is worshiping God. One of the first things we learn about worship is worship is our time for intimacy with God relationship with God. Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us the extent that God went through to give us this opportunity to enjoy his very presence in worship. So what we learn about worship is that in this experience, we're actually allowed to have a connection, an intimacy, a presence of the living God within us where there are no boundaries, 
no curtains of separation, no caste system where people are divided into more advantaged versus disadvantaged groupings. But matter of fact, even the leaders of worship are no more important than those participating in worship. Hence, we get the wonderful term, the priesthood of all what? Believers. It's a tenet of our faith, the priesthood of all believers. All of us are priests because of what Jesus did through his death. Now, how does this happen? Well, this happens because of the graphic death and resurrection of God through Jesus. This worship, you and I participate in where we're allowed to have the very presence of God within us and around us is a thing that happens because of Jesus' death. Now, if that doesn't make you ponder, if that doesn't touch your being, that God died for you, then you got to ask yourself, why am I here? You see, the one who is eternal dies so you can worship. The one who creation is created through dies so you can have an intimacy intimacy and a connection with God in worship. The one who is the source of all life dies so you and I can have this presence of God within us. And that's why we come to worship. We come to appreciate as well as encounter the one who deserves our focus and our connection. So what is this worship thing that I've been talking about? Well, William Temple says it this way. Worship is the submission of our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by the holiness of God, the nourishment of the mind by the truth of God, the purifying of the imagination by the beauty of God, and the opening of heart to the love of God, the submission of our will to the purposes of God. That's brilliant, isn't it? You have to meditate on that for a while to capture everything in there. So we learn right away worship is centralized in a person and not a place. Verse 19, therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. At that point, the temple and its purpose is destroyed and totally rerouted within the experience of humanity. And the hour is coming, Jesus would tell the woman at the well, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking those who will worship him. John 4, 23. Now, isn't that an incredible statement? The Father is seeking those who will worship him. Did you know God's looking for worshipers? God is actually looking for you to take moments, times out of your days and weeks to honor him with your presence. God's looking for us. And the reason is so simple. When you become a worshiper, you become one who receives this. You see, a lot of us think, well, we got to go to church to become a worker, to become a witness, and we get it backwards. We come to worship first and primarily, and because we worship, we become a worker and a witness. So the question becomes, if we're not witnessing, if we're not working, where's our worship? Now, you would think that people would voluntarily line up around the world to worship God, knowing that God was looking for worshipers. But I think today God is still looking for worshipers. God is not looking at church goer, for churchgoers. He's not even looking for church builders. God is looking for worshipers, people who come 
and try to link their heart to his heart through the grace of Christ and the power of his spirit. And when you understand what I mean by worship, I think you will understand why God is looking for worshipers. Dr. Warren Worsby has defined worship in this manner. Worship is the believer's response of all that one is, mind, emotions, will, and body, to all that God is, says, and does. Hmm. Worship was not put into a place through the death of Jesus so you and I could just enjoy a place of worship. Worship was put in place by the death of Jesus Christ so you and I could walk around as worshiping vessels. You see, worship isn't tied to a place. It's tied to who you know. You see, there was a time that the Jews considered that if you wanted to worship, you had to go to Jerusalem and you had to worship in that specific temple. But since Jesus came, there's a radical change. In the Old Testament, the temple God had was for his people. In the New Testament, God has his people for the temple. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says it this way, Do you not know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom God has placed there? You are not your own, for you are the temple of the living God. Do you know what your body is 24-7 a, a day? It's church! Be reminded of that the next time you're going out to a place you shouldn't be going or doing a thing you shouldn't be doing. You see, worship is not localized in a place. It is localized within the believing believer. You don't have to go to any certain church or any certain place in order to worship God. Now, does that raise some questions for you? Like, why am I here at 10 o'clock on Sundays? Besides the good looks of the preacher? Why do I go here? I often ask that question. Why am I here? Well, we're here because of Hebrews 10.25. And it makes it plain. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as if the manner of some, but exhort one another to... Do much more as we see the day approaching. We gather because of the dynamic thing that God does when we gather. Because then something unique happens. The spirit with you, within you gets connected to the spirit within someone else. And the next thing you know, you've got this moving, growing, breathing dynamic of the body of Christ coming together to make a difference within each other, within the relationship with God, and within the world. Worship is not about the style of clothes or the style of music. Worship is not about the building or the band. Worship is not about the liturgy or the lack of it. It's not about a charismatic preacher or the creative dramas or incredible videos. They are not essential to worship. Worship is not even about great musicians, talented choirs, though they've been known to redeem many a poor preachers on any Sunday. But worship is simple. It is about God, period. When the woman at the well has met up with Jesus and they're entering the discussion about her life and they began to discuss spiritual matters, she wanted to argue with Jesus about the holy mountain. Where should we worship, the holy mountain or in Jerusalem? And here is what Jesus said. Look at God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You see, when the woman came to Jesus, she would rather argue than adore. She would rather speak than surrender. But she would rather defend than follow. But Jesus would have nothing of that. He cut to the core, and he says, look it. Worship is utilizing your spirit to honor God's spirit. Pure and simple. All this stuff about dress and music style, instruments, symbols, all these arguments is the evil one's way to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. 
Amen? Amen. That's not to say we can't have an opinion and, and not one flavor impacts us better because of another flavor. I understand better than anyone that music is a language. I like it all. To be honest, this church doesn't rock enough, in my opinion. I'm a child of the 70s. I want to hear the bum. I want to hear the, the drum. I want to hear the bass of the beat. And I want to see and hear some guitar player, Eric, go absolutely crazy like Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> All to the glory of God. That's my flavor. But God even makes me worship in country music. That's a God-awful style of music. But what do you do when you hear Jesus take the wheel? What do you do when you hear Dolly Parton sing, there's Jesus? You, you, you can't do anything but get on your knees and worship. Even if you hate rap music. And somebody's going, bah, 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 God, I love Jesus. You got to appreciate that. Somewhere in the world, I don't know where, but somewhere in the world, that's going to touch somebody. I went to, uh, boy, am I off script. <laughs> I went to see Jason Wurstler when we were getting organized for uh, Impact Maslin. Jason runs uh, the construction program at Washington High School. And, and Jason's a dynamic, God-loving man, Christian dude. And I walk in to talk to all of his classes. I was there all day to talk to each class about impact masculine and volunteering. The music is going, bah, 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 and I'm going, how do you teach in here without a headache? But, but the music, you could see it immediately impact the kids. So we got to get over this thing about my style. It ain't my style. The question is, is what is my heart? Can my heart be open to the moving of God in different flavors of music, in different styles of music? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? Do you all have any idea where I am in my manuscript? <laughs> Kristen Stuckey's up there going, I have no clue. <laughs> You see, you and I were created to worship God. Psalm 1, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That means your dog, your cat, your fish, and you. Anybody who has breath, praise the Lord. Nothing else will satisfy your soul. When Noah stepped off the ark, he built an altar and worshiped God. Why? What else do you do after all that time with all those stinky animals trying to keep all those women at peace under one roof? <laughs> oh, you think I'm kidding? Have you ever had two wives live under one house? God help you if you do. They each want to be the boss. Kaboom! He had to after that wild ride. He says, I thank God I'm out of here. You see, nothing else will satisfy the soul. Do you know why God wants your focus? He wants your focus because his focus is on you. Think about that. His focus is on you. Have you ever been engaged in a relationship with someone or wanted a relationship with someone who they were not willing to give you the time of day? It's heartbreaking. You have this great love and affinity for someone, and at the same time, it's not reciprocated. It's heart-wrenching. And that's what God is going for, or going through. God, God is walking constantly, seeking those who he can share his love with, who will simply engage him in that love. You see, God never takes his eye off of you. God never takes his mind off of you. Your reference to the one lost sheep, Yvonne's perfect. Because that's what God wants. He's glad to have you all, but he's after the one whose heart isn't touching his. And he wants to do the same thing to everybody. 
He wants to have your attention because he knows what's best for you. And when your attention is on God, then you can focus on the world around you and give proper attention to them. In Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah went to the temple. Why did he go to the temple? King Uzziah was a great king. We have a hard time letting go of a presidency every four years. King Uzziah was a, pre- was a king for a long time. And when the king passed on, there was great turmoil, trepidation. Would the next king be a good king? I'm sure they had to deal with a conservative king and a liberal king. And each side's yelling, right? But for Israel, the king presented a a thing of uh, comfort. It was a thing of knowing. We know how he acts. We know what he does. He proved himself worthy. So now it's all up in the air. So where where does Isaiah go? When life is broken and he's not sure which end is up, he goes to worship. And in the midst of worship, he catches a glimpse of eternity. Think about the astrologers for a moment who came to see Jesus when he was born. Why did they do that? Why did they follow the star? Well, the scripture tells you to bow down and to worship the king. Their quest for the meaning, their meaning, was completed. You see, worship is to honor God. What's the song say? Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here we are to say what? You're my God or our God. You're altogether lovely. You're altogether holy. Altogether wonderful to me. That's worship. Our worship is to honor God. And when we honor God, then something else should happen. In Hebrews 10, 24, we read, Let us provoke one another to love and to do good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner is some. You see, worship engages people. I had a professor in seminary who was world-renowned in the concept of worship by the name of Robert Weber. He was crazy. There were times in class he would jump up on his desk just to keep your attention. And, And... absolute vital man of faith. And and he wrote a book that I still use in my worship classes today when I'm teaching worship. It's called Worship is a Verb. And it's not a passive verb. It is an active verb. It is not something that is done for us. It is something we do. John Killinger stated once that worship is a drama. Not a drama where you just sit back and watch it all happen, but it's a drama that you engage in. You're the actors. And who's the audience? But God, the audience of one. We're the ones doing the roles, and God's the audience in worship. In real worship, the choir, the band, the preacher, we're all prompters to help all of us encounter the one true God and put our focus on God, who is our audience. The question is not, did worship please me? Wrong question. The question is, does my worship of God please God? I go to my desk every Sunday morning, bright and early. I bow my head, and one of the things I do is I pray over my sermon, I pray over the worship service, and I say constantly to God, may you be honored by what we do here. That's the purpose of why we gather. May God be honored. You think I like getting up at the time before the sun comes up? No, but but there isn't a time I don't wake up before my alarm goes off. Why? Because I'm excited and I know God is going to meet us here. And since I'm meddling, if you come in late, if you leave early, if you just kind of half-heartedly participate, we might want to ask, was God pleased with our worship today? Was God pleased? So how do we engage in worship? Let, let me suggest a couple of ways. We engage in worship by Scripture, first of all. Pretty simple, huh? 
God's word is a lamp and a light unto my feet, right? And a light unto my path. The sermons, the songs we sing, the liturgy we engage ourselves in are all scripturally oriented. Thanks be to God, it is more important that you know what happens in the book called the Bible than what happens in the news today. Worship is about scripture. We can worship at the altar of the Almighty, but I personally don't also want to go to a church that doesn't look at the cross of Christ. That's another thing. Do any of you see a cross of Christ here? Yeah, there's three of them. For those of you who may not be very focused, there is one in the middle. <laughs> Somebody's going, I've never seen that before. <laughs> Which is the bigger one? The middle. Why? Because it reflects Luke's crucifixion. Dummy on the left of him, a dummy on the right of him, and Jesus in the middle taking him home if they'll let him. It, we, the cross is all about what our faith is. Isn't it? It's what Jesus did. And the reason we look at the cross so often is because life is hard. Life is hard. Why do people suffer? Why do wars rage? Why are the poor ignored? How dare we turn our backs on the children of the world? The cross demands us to look at all of that and let our faith impact all those people. The cross is about the pain and suffering of God for you. We need to be convicted that way. That's what worship is about. Come now, let's reason together that some of these problems in the world can be solved by our faith, by the action of God, if we lose some of our selfishness and do something about it. You see, even how we engage in worship is vital. I, you all might think I'm crazy, but have you ever watched me worship? I am all over the place. I mean, I am feeling the words. I'm motioning the words. Matter of fact, when we get up there and sang uh, All Gut Creatures of Our God and King, I wanted to act like I was with the preschool program when they talked about, let the brightening sun shine, and then the soft mirror will gleam, you know. That's the way we can be. We can be so engaged that we get lost in the words and in the music and just let it go in the midst of worship. I sing with gusto. I give it all I have. I clap. I can dance. I can move. I can groove in worship. But I promise you one thing, I will not dance naked in church like David did. You only wish, don't you? <laughs> I know you couldn't handle the physique, so I'm not going to tempt you. <laughs> right, Bruce? <laughs> so, in the midst of worship, I celebrate with those who are celebrating. I cry with those who cry. God's pouring out, and then I move to the knees of my heart when I encounter it. Now, a lot of us have kind of backslidden, and we're kind of like going, Amen. 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 <laughs> we're afraid to even let it out. What's happened to us? Worship was never meant to be boring. That's why the Bible tells us, clap our hands, all our people, shout to the Lord and dance triumph, right? Let the amen sound from God's people again. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> See, here's the thing. You know, you put a family together, you get a clan. When you put a bunch of sports fans together at a local high school football field, you get a crowd. You call a church meeting and you get a congregation. But when God gathers God's people together, not driven by their own interests, but centered on the mind of Christ, the heart of the Spirit, and the community of faith, the world marvels because barriers break down. And they can see people loving and acting towards one another that lets the world take notice. 
May God help us become that community of faith. Because you understand why we are called to be so different than the world around us? Why we are called to love each other no matter what caste we come from, what part of society or economic circumstance or what our race may be or whatever? Do you understand why? Because when, God, when people see the unity of God within people, they marvel. They absolutely marvel. And when we do, it is a foretaste of the glory divine that we're going to encounter. You see, worship is that thing that we can encounter in the very presence of God now that will also give us a glimpse of where it's going to be like in eternity. Worship is a foretaste of the glory divine. Mark Twain said, if heaven is one endless choir rehearsal summer, he didn't think he'd bother to try out. For those who can't sing, I can somewhat understand that. But you need to know. First of all, heaven's a lot more than singing. Secondly, there will not be any bad singers in heaven. And you know why? Because there's going to be a whole lot of joy going around. A whole lot of joy. One of the things I love the most is like when our preschool program's doing their their Christmas program or when our kids are singing at church and you got that one boy who is shouting it out and is totally off tune. It's okay. I love it. He's singing from his heart. I don't know about you, but every now and then I could use a little taste of heaven. And that's what this is about. I don't know about you, but occasionally I'd like to have that taste come in and have those moments where heaven breaks open within me. There was a great movie made years ago called Places of the Heart with Sally Fields, and it's interesting. The movie opens up with her and her children and her husband, who's the sheriff of town, worshiping. Soon thereafter, her husband is killed. She's got a fight for the farm she is in. She found an African-American at the time who would help her do that. He's ultimately chased out of town. And she remains true, and they survive. And at the end of the movie, where are they again? They're back in church singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. This is my story. This is my song. I hope it is yours as well. Let me tell you something about God that most people go through their life and don't understand. God doesn't want our ritual. God doesn't want our religion. God doesn't want rules. God doesn't even want regulations. He wants our relationship. Our relationship. And once we have relationship with God, that love will pour out. Shakespeare once said, they do not love who do not show their love. Are we showing our love? Let's pray together. Lord, I pray you would move in powerful ways, that you would take our lives, help us, let them be yours, so that we in a unique way could grow more and more regarding our relationship with you and our taste of the foretaste of things to come. Help us, Lord, reflect you and your glory. Help us, Lord, honor you with worship. Every day, every moment, and every week, we gather as your community. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord stand, and let's sing our final hymn together.
remember this passage from 1 Chronicles 29, 11, the, throughout the rest of your week. Yours, Lord, is the greatest in the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. Go throughout this week, uh, continuing to breaking down those barriers of worship. Uh, one last thing before you go, Andrea and Eric will be in the communication, con sorry, connect corner with more information about the fall guide, uh, fall programming. <laughs> Have a good week.